personal pleasure to introduce um, Assemblyman Richard Gottfried, who represents the 75th Assembly District, which is Chelsea, Hell's Kitchen, Murray Hill, Midtown, part of Lincoln Center in Manhattan. He's chair of the Assembly Health Committee, which he's been since 1987. He uh, is a major architect of New York's landmark managed care reforms, continues to fight for stronger protections for consumers and healthcare providers, and public support for universal access to quality, affordable health care. You all know him probably by the, um, the, the fact that he's been sponsoring a, uh, a bill that would actually guarantee all New Yorkers health insurance um, and health coverage, the radical idea. Um, highlights of his legislative work include the passage of prenatal care assistance program for low-income women, the Child Health Plus program, which allows for low and moderate income parents to get free or low cost health insurance for their kids. The law that gives patients access to information about a doctor's background and malpractice record. Family Health Plus, which provided for low, uh, free health coverage for low income adults. And many other things which I won't read, so I'm taking up too much of his time. In the legislature, he's been a leading proponent of patient autonomy, especially in end of life care and reproductive freedom. He also sponsors the New York Health Bill to create universal, publicly funded, single-payer health coverage for New York State. He was elected first for, to the Assembly in 1970 at the age of 23 while a student at Columbia Law School. And Dick's been a, a really, really great supporter of the Institute, our educational programs, our service programs. Um, and somebody who really understands in depth the healthcare issues um, in the state. We're fortunate to have him and to um, have him kick off our, our year's uh, grand round. So, Dick, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Neil. Um, you know, I have uh, in my work benefited from working with a, a lot of really good teachers, and Neil, you are certainly one of them. Um, so uh, our topic is uh, making health policy in New York State. Uh, first question is, why would one talk about that? And the answer is that in health policy, as in an awful lot of areas of, uh, of public policy, uh, the state is actually the dominant uh, policy making level. Um, you know, I, I, most New York City residents uh, read in the paper all the time about, uh, about City Hall or about Washington. Uh, you really don't re read a whole lot about state government, and what you do uh, basically says it's, it's a swamp of corruption. The less you, you know about it, the happier you'll be. Um, which I could talk about, but not this morning. Um, and yet, in, in health policy, uh, the state is, is the dominant policy-making level. Uh, physicians and social workers and physical therapists uh, are not licensed by City Hall uh, or CMS or anyone else in Washington. They are licensed by the New York State Education Department. Uh, the rules against uh, corporate practice of medicine and whether uh, a physician uh, can be in a joint practice with a physical therapist. By the way, the answer is no. Um, those are not federal or city rules. Those are, that is, New York state law and New York regulation. Um, this building uh, is a hospital. Washington did not say it's a hospital. City Hall did not say it's a hospital. The state of New York said it's a hospital. It is licensed under Article 28 of the state's public health law. Uh, almost every regulation affecting this building uh, is a health department regulation, uh, state health department. There are plenty of Medicare regulations, uh, but every patient in this building Everything that anybody does in this building uh, is, uh, is subject to state regulation. Uh, who can own this hospital is also state law. Uh, the fact that New York is the only state in the union 
for which I am eternally grateful and I think have a large part in protecting. The fact that New York is the only state in the union where a publicly traded for-profit company uh, cannot own a hospital uh, is state law. Uh, 49 other states don't have that law. Um, almost all of our public health regulations uh, are state regulations. Uh, uh, whether a child has to be vaccinated for uh, uh, one thing or another before going to public school uh, is entirely state law. Uh, and when people in the legislature propose adding a disease to that, um, you know, there was a point where I would ask, you know, does the CDC require that? And after the first time I asked that, um, I was told, actually, the CDC doesn't require anything. Uh, they recommend things, but they don't require things. Um, interestingly, in New York City, because our city health department goes back to the 1800s, long before the state had a health department, there is a long custom that a lot of local public health things uh, in New York City are city law, but nowhere else in the state. If you're born in New York City, you have a New York City birth certificate filed with the New York City Department of Health. If you're born in Syracuse, uh, it is a state birth certificate filed in Albany. Um, the Medicaid program, uh, the federal government pays us uh, a little more than half uh, the money for Medicaid, and the federal government certainly sets uh, a variety of mandates that our Medicaid program uh, has to meet. Uh, but beyond that, uh, the, the, the bulk of Medicaid regulations uh, in New York, and I think in every other state, uh, are state regulations. Uh, there are things that we do where we get uh, federal permission to do them in Medicaid, uh, but that's mostly because we are asking the federal government to pay us more uh, for Medicaid, or if, if what we're doing is going to save money, we're asking the federal government to let us keep uh, the savings instead of paying it back to them, uh, a process known as a, a federal waiver. Um, but uh, if you're a New Yorker, if you're involved in healthcare in New York and you're wondering, you know, what's the future of Medicaid, uh, you know, you wanted to know what Jason Helgerson uh, was thinking uh, until he uh, left state government a few months ago. Uh, he was our Medicaid director for about seven years. Um, controlled substances, uh, to bring us a little closer to part of our topic this morning, uh, are an interesting mixed jurisdiction. Uh, the federal government uh, certainly uh, does some very tight regulation of controlled substances. Uh, the fact that marijuana is a Schedule I substance, which means the federal government deems that it has no legitimate medical use, um, uh, is obviously federal legislation. Uh, the 1970 Controlled Substances Act. Uh, New York has also a controlled substances schedule. It matches just about 100% uh, the federal schedule. Uh, we very consciously march in lockstep with uh, the federal schedule, um, but that's because the legislature chooses to do that. Uh, we could add something else to the uh, to our controlled substance schedule uh, or drop something that the feds have on their schedule. We have never done that, and I doubt we ever will. Um, the, um, so uh, the, what is the structure of New York state government, particularly as it uh, relates to, uh, 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 to health policy? Uh, for those of you who come from another state or may at some point go to another state, uh, don't expect the things I tell you today uh, to apply when you get back there or go there. Uh, every state is different, uh, some dramatically different. There are states with strong governors. There are states with extremely weak governors. There are states with very strong party division in their legislative bodies. 
Uh, there are states that have no party division in their legislative bodies. Uh, the state of Nebraska uh, uniquely not only has only one house in their legislature, um, but they, the candidates are elected not on the basis of party identification, and they sit intermixed, which well, every time I think of that, it kind of gives me the willies. Um, you know, that I would be sitting next to a, uh, I don't want to think about that. Um, we get along, but sitting next to each other, I don't know. Um, uh, so every state is, is different. Um, I'm told in Massachusetts they say that the Speaker of the House of their uh, lower chamber uh, serves at the pleasure of the United States Attorney. Um, so, New York is a state with a strong uh, executive. Uh, our governor, I don't know if, if he's the most powerful governor in, in the country. Uh, he's, if not, he's got to be in the running. Um, under our state constitution, the governor has extraordinary powers relating to the state budget, which in many ways drives uh, almost everything uh, every year, the budget that we enact. Uh, the, uh, I, I could go into the details of the court decisions, but this is a medical school, not uh, a law school. Um, suffice to say, uh, we really cannot enact a budget in New York State unless the legislature reaches an agreement uh, with the governor. And there are things a governor will negotiate and agree to, and there are things that a governor won't. Same is true for the legislature. Uh, but when we enact a budget, it is a result of a, of a three-way uh, negotiation. Uh, I think in almost every other state, if the legislature wants to enact uh, changes in the budget that the governor doesn't like, they may have to override a governor's veto, but legally they can do it. We cannot. Um, regulations in New York State play an enormous part in, uh, in, in, in state policy. Uh, the Constitution doesn't say it has to be that way, but uh, that is how things have evolved. And that is particularly true in the area of health policy. Uh, the state health commissioner uh, has some of the most sweeping uh, regulation-making powers uh, uh, of anyone in state government. Uh, his authority to make regulations governing uh, hospitals and nursing homes and community health centers uh, is very briefly and generally stated. Uh, which means there's an awful lot uh, that, that, a, that a health commissioner can do. Um, in 1988 or 89, uh, David Axelrod, the, the, the health commissioner David Axelrod, not Obama's political consultant, um, uh, using the fact that state law says he can make regulations to protect the public health, said, OK, we're not going to have smoking anymore in indoor uh, workplaces and the like. Um, a lot of us were delighted that he did that. Um, uh, a lot, some people took him to court. Uh, and the Court of Appeals said, you can do almost anything, but that's really legislating, um, which resulted about a year or two later in the legislature enacting those regs. But um, it was, in, in some ways, a, a standout exception that the courts said that the health commissioner could not do something. Uh, I mean, he can wake up one morning and quarantine Syracuse uh, if he wants. Um, uh, I mentioned overriding governor's vetoes. Uh, you know, if two thirds of the assembly and two thirds of the Senate vote to override a governor's veto, we get to do that except in the area of uh, the budget. Uh, but that virtually never happens. Uh, somehow, governors over the years managed to convince the legislature that overriding a governor's veto uh, is an obscene uh, act of unpardonable uh, uh, aggression. Uh, and so we virtually never do that. Um, and again, that gives a governor uh, a substantial amount of power. 
Um, interest groups uh, of all kinds uh, have gotten into the habit, partly because governors have made it clear to them that uh, if you want anything done, uh, do it this way. Interest groups negotiate with the governor uh, much more than they negotiate with uh, the state legislature. Uh, Neil, in his bio of me, mentioned uh, the state's uh, uh, patient pr consumer protection laws. Uh, most of those were enacted uh, in 96. Uh, we'd been advocating for them for several years in the legislature. Uh, the governor called in the insurance industry, the medical profession, some consumer advocates, uh, swore them all to secrecy, as they always do, and said, we're going to negotiate the, the managed care reforms, and I'm going to then submit them to the legislature, and you're all going to support them. That is exactly what happened. Uh, the governor submitted the bill. Uh, I think we may have moved a comma in the bill, but that was about it, because when we looked around and said, anybody want to help us add something, uh, there were no takers. Uh, everybody had been uh, locked into supporting the product of the negotiation, and that kind of thing happens a lot. Um, not always, but a lot. Um, the legislature. Um, Two chambers, uh, what I like to call the larger house, the assembly. Some people call it the lower house. I don't like that term. Um, uh, and, and a state senate. We all run on two-year terms, single-member districts. Uh, uh, the state senate has one particular power that the assembly does not. Namely, uh, they get to approve uh, governor uh, appointees for cabinet positions and some judgeships and the like. Um, other than that, the two chambers are, are, are uh, you know, pretty much the same. Uh, similarly organized, uh, a bill can originate in either house. It's not like Congress where a revenue raising measure must originate in the, in the House, not the Senate. Uh, none of that. Um, both legislative chambers are what political scientists would say, uh, would call highly organized. Um, what that means is that they both have a fairly strong structure, uh, and there is a structured process uh, for decision making that is uh, rarely departed from. Um, this has evolved, in, in my thinking over the years, as an almost Darwinian uh, set of survival mechanisms. Uh, the legislature uh, needs to protect itself uh, from being dominated uh, by governors, by interest groups. Uh, everybody in the state thinks they should decide what the legislature does, and we have this quaint notion that we think we should. Um, a key fact about the New York legislature, um, which affects a lot of how we do business, is that we are, a by, con by the Constitution, both chambers, in order to do almost anything, uh, have to have not a majority vote of those present and voting, uh, but a majority of the whole chamber. So in Washington, if there's a bill on the floor of the House and two people vote yes and one person votes no, the bill has been passed. In the New York State Assembly, where we have 150 members, uh, if a lot of people aren't in the room and 75 vote yes and nobody votes no or two or three people vote no, you might think 75 yes, two or three no, the bill passed. No, the bill has been defeated because until you get to 76 votes, the bill does not pass, similarly in the State Senate. Um, that has a lot of impact on how the, each chamber operates in part because if you are the speaker of the assembly or the majority leader in the state senate and you want things to go forward, you not only need the support of most of the members of your party, you need the support of 76 of them. And that's a little easier when you're in the assembly where we have 107 Democrats at the moment. Um, but think of it, if one group of about a dozen Democrats is annoyed with the speaker, and then another group of about a dozen Democrats is annoyed with the speaker, 
and two or three of them on a given day think they have a meeting to go to that's more important, all of a sudden the speaker doesn't have 76 votes on the floor of the assembly. Not a good thing if you're the speaker. Um, so in both chambers, the, the majority party is very strongly internally organized. Uh, if the Democratic conference decides we're going forward with something, uh, hardly any Democrat is going to go off the reservation. Uh, and we're not going to have a bill on the floor of the assembly that the Democratic conference has not uh, either tacitly or, or explicitly uh, decided should be there. Um, we have a very strong leadership structure. Uh, committee chairs uh, in the assembly have uh, significant influence uh, over what their committee does. Um, I say committee chairs. There are many committees uh, where the dominant uh, role is played by the central staff who report to the speaker uh, who, are, who staff that committee. Uh, there are other committees where the chair, uh, based on his or her relationship with the speaker, uh, is the dominant person, and it's the chair's staff uh, reporting to the chair uh, that, that are the key people. Um, I'm very happy to report to you that the health committee is one of those committees. Uh, were that not the case, I probably several decades ago would have found some other way to earn a living. Um, uh, the, the majority party's leader, speaker in the assembly, majority leader in the state senate, uh, is responsible for helping to form uh, the majority party's consensus position. Uh, that is often done, or sometimes done, through a uh, discussion in our Democratic conference. Uh, it is most commonly done fairly informally, because the speaker, if he's worth his salt, uh, knows what his colleagues want and don't want, uh, or would want if they knew what the issue was. Uh, for example, there are plenty of times where in a budget there is something on the table that, let's say, Local 1199, the hospital workers union, uh, is very much in favor of or against. Uh, the speaker knows that he doesn't need to ask around among assembly Democrats, should we go along with what 1199 wants? Because the answer is almost always, well, duh, of course. Um, another piece of health policy news. Um, by the way, part of 1199's power is that they learned about 1990 or so uh, that, and, and, and the hospital industry learned it as well, that while they may knock each other's brains out at the bargaining table, if they come to Albany totally united, and if they work with the majority party in both houses, there is very little they can't achieve. Um, some people are happy about that. There are some people who aren't. Um, so the speaker helps form the majority party's consensus. Uh, part of his job is to protect uh, the interests of Democratic Assembly members or Republican senators, for, the, for now, um, uh, who run in districts where, uh, that, are, that are not safe districts. And there are some issues that you don't want on the floor if you're trying to protect people who run in marginal districts. Uh, the speaker also tries to prevent us from bringing bills to the floor that, uh, that even a large handful of Democrats really hate. Uh, I have had many occasions in my career uh, where legislation that is very important to me, that has the support of most of my colleagues, most of my Democratic colleagues, um, but eight or 10 or 15 Democrats really hate it, uh, the speaker will not bring that bill to the floor, uh, much to my annoyance. Um, but I understand that the reason he does that is that it is in my interests, even when it's my bill not coming to the floor, uh, it is in my interest for 
the Democratic majority to be cohesive and, and, uh, and that there be as many of us as possible. Um, a critical job of the Speaker uh, or the majority leader in the Senate is to negotiate with the governor uh, and sometimes with interest groups. Uh, an awful lot of issues that need to be negotiated with the executive branch or with the Senate, I and my staff can handle. Uh, Senator Hanna and the Republican who chairs the Senate Health Committee, he and I work out dozens and dozens of issues a year. I negotiate dozens and dozens of issues with the governor's staff uh, every year. Um, but there are sometimes issues that can't get resolved at that level and get uh, kicked upstairs. Uh, now, if I try to go negotiate with the governor, you know, I'm you know, an annoying, buzzing fly to any governor. Um, the speaker, the governor can't ignore. Uh, and so when I need my own, as the term is, not my term, of course, 800-pound gorilla uh, to negotiate with the governor, 800-pound gorilla, if we don't have a strong speaker, uh, I'm out of luck. Uh, fundamental fact about negotiating. Nobody negotiates with somebody who can't deliver. If you want a Ford automobile, you're not going to negotiate price with a Chrysler dealer because he or she can't deliver you a Ford. Uh, nobody's going to negotiate legislation with the Speaker of the Assembly if at the end the Speaker can't say, yeah, the Assembly will do this. And so when the Speaker comes back to the Democratic conference and says, here's the budget package I negotiated, if we don't back him up, we are, he is dead and we are dead. And so we do back him up. Um, and that is a pretty fundamental issue in, in, or aspect of, 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 of state government. Um, interest groups, a lot of interest groups are very, very powerful in New York. Uh, some of them, their power comes from campaign contributions. Uh, New York has very generous campaign finance laws, shall we say. Um, many of them derive their power from having a large uh, public following. Uh, uh, the pro-choice movement uh, derives its power in New York uh, largely on that basis. Um, but many have their substantive uh, power, uh, particularly in the area of health care, uh, because legislators, uh, by and large, understand that we are enormously ignorant and we don't really want to screw things up. And so when the medical society comes to us and says, uh, you know, if you let certified nurse anesthetists uh, do all the things that they want to do, people are going to die. And one of them might be you, you know, that scares the pants off us. Um, not me, because I support the nurse anesthetist, but um, uh, it, it's, it, it's a going against the medical society on a, on a clinical issue is, is very difficult. Um, so let's talk about uh, medical marijuana. Um, I'm going on longer than I wanted to. Um, so I first introduced the bill in 1997 after California adopted medical marijuana through a referendum. Um, let's talk about substantive law a little bit. Uh, Neil asked me to talk about this a little. Um, under federal law, marijuana is a Schedule I controlled substance, uh, which means it has no legitimate, uh, no recognized legitimate medical use, which means, among other things, uh, well, if you possess it, it's a crime. Uh, if you are a licensed prescriber who values having your DEA uh, number so you can prescribe, uh, uh, you know, little things like fentanyl, um, uh, you will obey the federal prohibition on writing what is called a prescription, uh, a very important word uh, for a Schedule I substance. Uh, if you are a pharmacy and you want to be able to sell fentanyl, um, along with the beef jerky and the children's toys and school supplies, um, uh, you, you cannot dispense uh, a controlled substance, um, a, a Schedule I controlled substance. 
And therefore, what California did and what every other state that has adopted uh, a medical marijuana law, including New York, is that we avoid those words. Uh, we don't call it a prescription. We call it either, some states call it a recommendation, some states like New York call it uh, certifying a patient. Uh, and the place where you go to pick up your medical marijuana for a lot of money is not a pharmacy. Uh, it is a state licensed dispensary. Um, they all hire a pharmacist because uh, the regulations say they have to. Uh, I assume those are all pharmacists who have decided this is a better line of work than having a DEA license. Um, or they're taking their chances. Um, and so we created this elaborate parallel structure to Article 33 of the public health law uh, with rules about packaging and licensing of people who manufacture it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the regulations we enacted for marijuana are actually, in some ways, absurdly uh, more restrictive than uh, uh, the regulations for people who just want to sell uh, fentanyl. Um, um, but that's been changing, which I'll talk about. Um, the, the process of getting the bill enacted, I first introduced the bill in 1997. It was signed into law uh, 17 years later in June of 14. Um, I seem to specialize in bills that take a long time to get enacted. Um, as it went through all that process, trying to bring on board one group or another to either support it or not oppose it, uh, an awful lot of bells and whistles and restrictions uh, got added to it, um, which is part of the process. Um, for example, at one point the bill um, allowed people to grow their own at home. That fell out uh, pretty early, um, although it makes perfect sense to me. Um, uh, smoking, uh, medical marijuana is not allowed. Uh, vaping, yes. Uh, pills, lotions, oils, OK. Not smoking, not something called edibles. Some would think that if you swallow a pill, you're Met, that it, you're eating it, but we've agreed not to think that. Um, <laughs> marijuana is the only medication that I'm aware of, maybe one of you can set me straight, uh, for which there is a statutory list of things that it can be, I'll say prescribed for, but th that's not what we do, for things that it can legally be uh, used for. Um, uh, not for, you know, there are FDA regulations about what a drug company can market their product for, uh, but there is no regulation that I know of as to what a uh, physician can write a prescription for uh, or for what purpose. Um, you might get sued if you damage your patient, but there's no law that says uh, you can't write a morphine prescription for a bad hair day or a stubbed toe. Um, don't do that, but there's no law that says you can't do that. Um, but there is a restricted list of conditions. Uh, we did get language that allows the health commissioner to add to that list, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, took a long time to get the bill out of the health committee that I chair. Uh, because a lot of my colleagues didn't want to vote for it. Uh, it took several years both to get it out of the health committee uh, and to the floor of the assembly, because there were two or three other committees it had to go through, and to, uh, to be taken up for a vote uh, and pass in the assembly. That was, I guess, sometime in the early, mid-2000s, um, which uh, I think is a, an illustration of the fact that while as a committee chair, I, the committee will almost always do what I am recommending. Uh, not always. Um, not often enough. Um, uh, it became clear as the process went on that, well, obviously, for any bill to become a law, you need it to pass not only the assembly, but the Senate and get signed by the governor. It also became clear that if we had either of them, 
uh, that would probably bring us the other. Because certainly if a governor says, this makes sense, uh, that gives it a lot more credibility than just me saying it makes sense. Uh, so we put a lot of effort uh, when Elliot Spitzer became governor uh, in 07 to bringing him on board. Um, we met constantly with uh, people on the health department staff, including the health commissioner, Richard Daines, uh, a wonderful individual, by the way, who I miss every day. Um, he died shortly after uh, uh, leaving as health commissioner. Um, we got a lot of recommendations from the health department that we put in the bill. We got recommendations from, or request, demands, I suppose, uh, from the governor's uh, council's office, uh, the councils who work on health issues, and the councils who work on criminal justice uh, issues. Virtually anything that the governor's people said they wanted in the bill, we did. Because um, we were really, partly because they were reasonable, didn't do any real damage, uh, but also because we really, really, really wanted uh, the governor on board. Uh, in early, well, in 08, we were really close um, to getting this done for two reasons. Number one, in early 08, we had done everything that the governor's people asked us to do. It was pretty clear that uh, given a little time, they would be on board. Then March 10th, 2008 happened. Uh, some of you may not be old enough to remember that, but that was when Elliot Spitzer got caught uh, patronizing prostitutes and two days later uh, resigned as governor. And an awful lot of things that he was on board with kind of went down the tubes. Uh, medical marijuana uh, with it, because uh, it, while David Patterson, who was the lieutenant governor, who became governor, had been a co-sponsor of the bill when he was in the state senate, uh, once he became governor, he was rethinking and re-examining a whole lot of things, and medical marijuana was one of them. Um, in the state senate, interestingly, we were virtually there. Uh, Joe Bruno, who was the Republican majority leader at the time, was asked by the press what he thought about medical marijuana. He said a couple of sentences, and I was trying to find it on my thumb drive and couldn't. It makes me nuts. Um, a nearly poetic couple of lines about medical marijuana and why we should be doing this to help people who are suffering. I would have loved to have been the author of that paragraph. Um, and it was like, wow, this is going to happen. In June of 08, the Supreme Court came down with a couple of decisions. Um, one very good, uh, which said that if a physician in a medical marijuana state issues a certification, quote unquote, uh, for medical marijuana, as long as you don't call it a prescription, it is a First Amendment act. And you have an absolute First Amendment act uh, right uh, to issue such a certificate. And the federal government can't lay a glove on you. But the Supreme Court also said, um, in a fairly vague decision, that yes, the federal government could regulate this sort of thing. Now, this was in early June. The legislature adjourns in mid-late June. By around July, August, people had thought enough about that court decision to realize that it did not shut down state medical marijuana laws. But in the first week or two after that decision hit, a lot of people thought, oh, I guess that's the end. There's nothing we can do about it. And so the state Senate, which was, I think, on the verge of saying, yeah, let's close a deal and pass a bill, said, oh, that's too bad. Uh, I guess we can't. Um, and so 08 came and went. Uh, for the next several years, nothing much happened on the issue. Uh, public support slowly built. Um, in the 2012 to 2014 period, uh, a couple of things happened. The main thing that happened is that the state Senate, Republican majority, uh, pretty much came on board and ultimately did come on board. Why? 
uh, because you might think, and you'd be right, that legislators in New York, particularly Republican legislators in New York, are very wary of touching anything having to do with drugs. Um, two, uh, three things. One, I had very little ever nice to say about the fact that a handful of Democrats in the state Senate broke away from the majority and formed a coalition government with the Senate Republicans, uh, a group called the Independent Democratic Conference, or IDC. Um, but they did. One of the Democrats who joined that coalition with the Republicans uh, was Diane Savino, who was the Senate sponsor of the medical marijuana bill. Suddenly, we had a prominent majority party, uh, majority coalition member of the state Senate as the lead sponsor on the medical marijuana bill. Um, and she was very, very committed to it uh, and just worked her butt off uh, bringing on one Republican senator after another uh, supporting the bill. Second thing that happened, capitalism. Uh, there are some very big companies in the marijuana world uh, at that point in other states. They started coming to New York and hiring lobbyists and telling Republican legislators how wonderful it would be if they could be doing business in New York. Um, I assume a fair amount of campaign contributions uh, were, uh, uh, were provided uh, in any event uh, as that phenomenon grew, the Republicans became more and more uh, open to medical marijuana. The last thing which utterly made the difference was the people who discovered that CBD oil, uh, uh, cannabidiol, uh, uh, an extract of marijuana with virtually zero THC, the stuff that makes you high, discovered that, that, that CBD oil has an almost unbelievably dramatic effect on virtually eliminating seizures among young children with a, a variety of epilepsy called Dravet syndrome. There is another epilepsy syndrome where it also has effect, I just don't remember its name. Um, when the families with Dravet syndrome children, these are children who have scores, sometimes hundreds of massive seizures a day, started coming to Albany with their infants and preteen and you know children uh, going door to door with their children talking to legislators. Nobody who met with one of those families could say, no. Um, interestingly, the governor refused to meet with them. Uh, but the Dravet syndrome families turned this from being, eh, we think we're going to be able to do it, to being inevitable and a tidal wave. Um, I mean, you don't often see grown up, middle aged, male Republican legislators in tears about a legislative issue. That was happening on a regular basis. Um, so late May, it becomes clear that both houses are, have a, we've, we've negotiated a bill with the Senate. It's about to pass both houses. Everybody knows it. So Diane Savino and I get a phone call from the governor's office. I guess it was one of the last days of May. You got to come down. The governor wants to talk to you. Um, it was one of my most unpleasant experiences uh, in the legislature. Um, the governor was really ticked off. Um, he didn't like the idea of medical marijuana. Uh, he thought it would be like you know the downfall of civilization, uh, and. He was livid that the Assembly and Senate were going to negotiate a bill and, as he put it, you know, try to jam him up 
uh, by putting it on his desk, because he knew that a strong majority of New Yorkers uh, supported it. And so we had a very unpleasant discussion with the governor about changes that he wanted made. Um, I wouldn't call it a negotiation, uh, because that, you know, that kind of implies two sides. Um, so Diane and I go back upstairs from the second floor where the governor is to the third floor. We talk to our respective legislative leaders. Um, a lot of what the governor wanted we really didn't like but felt we could live with. There were a couple of things that uh, really, we really, really didn't want to do. Fortunately, on the assembly side, some of the things that I really, really didn't want to do, uh, the speaker and his people really, really didn't want to do, uh, like restrictions on, uh, you know, if you've ever had a criminal record, could you work in the mar medical marijuana uh, industry? The governor wanted a complete ban on that. That really offended the assembly's criminal justice people. And while I could not stand up to the governor on issues like that, the speaker, my 800-pound gorilla, could. And thanks to his backing on some of those issues, uh, we were able to negotiate uh, not as good a bill as I would have wanted. It still had some things that I really didn't like. Uh, but we were able uh, to negotiate a bill. Uh, and that whole process took about three days after 17 years. Um, you know, it's like somebody who's been in the theater their whole life for 25 years and they're in a hit show and they call them an overnight success. Um, it took about three days to nail this down from the first nasty conversation uh, to a, to a three-way agreement on a bill. Um, so some of the things that uh, got narrowed down uh, both in the bill and then later in regulations, one is something called vertical integration a term that is, by the way, becoming an issue throughout healthcare. Uh, in antitrust law, there are two kinds of integration of an economic unit. There is horizontal integration, where uh, you know, a bunch of stores in town all become one store. That's horizontal integration, an antitrust violation, or at least it was uh, a generation ago when America still enforced antitrust laws. Um, but there is also something called vertical integration, where the manufacturer and the distributor and the retailer are all one economic uh, unit. Uh, there is almost nothing that you buy uh, that comes from a vertically integrated market. Uh, in many areas of the law, vertical integration is prohibited. Uh, in New York, you will never see a Budweiser bar and grill because if you make alcohol, you may not retail alcohol. Uh, you will never go in America, well, not at th this time. Uh, for the past couple of generations, you don't go to an MGM movie theater, because if you make movies, you may not own theaters. You may also not distribute movies, which is why when you go to the movies, you see all those names of, you know, a so-and-so film distributed by so-and-so. You know? The governor wanted vertical integration in marijuana. I don't know why, doesn't make sense to me, but he was very insistent on that and believed that the language that he put in the bill would require vertical integration. So the, what we call a registered organization, the things we license, uh, would both grow the plants, process it, ship it from the processing plant to the dispensary, not by hiring FedEx or the Brinks company. They had to own their own trucks and hire their own drivers um, and deliver it to a dispensary that they own. Uh, and that's currently the law. Uh, and they insisted on that being in the bill. Um, they insisted that a registered organization could only have up to four dispensaries. And so today we have 10 registered organizations. Uh, they are. They don't all have their full four, but they're moving there, which means in a state of 20 million people, uh, there are 40 places where you can get medical marijuana. Uh, I would say within a short walk of where we are standing today, there are 40 places where you can buy fentanyl and morphine uh, right next to the beef jerky. Um, but 
not medical marijuana. Um, there are limitations in the law. Well, there's authority in the law for the health department to limit the form that it can take, uh, the, the pills, the oils, uh, what percentage of this ingredient and that. Um, the governor insisted that the certification could be written only by a physician. Now, in New York State, fentanyl can be prescribed. I don't know why I keep liking talking about fentanyl, but, um, well, you know why. Um, <laughs> A physician can write a prescription for fentanyl, so can a nurse practitioner, so can a physician assistant, so can a midwife, or a podiatrist or a dentist. Uh, under the medical marijuana law, the governor insisted it could only be written by a physician. Uh, I have spent a lot of time and effort in the legislature lobbying for legislation for the nurse practitioners and the PAs. I was able to get him to agree to say that nurse practitioners could write a certification if the health commissioner, uh, you know, a year or so later, uh, issued a regulation allowing that. Um, couldn't get him to agree to PAs. I guess, I don't think he fully understood what a PA does uh, and what their legal authority is. Um, hardly anybody does, unless they're a physician or a PA, um, or me. Um, or the chair of the Higher Education Committee where licensure laws go. Um, and of course, uh, the governor insisted that the, uh, the limitation on conditions in the bill not be including but not limited to, which was the way it was originally written, but had to be a definitive list, although the health commissioner could add uh, conditions. Fortunately, in, since the start of 2016, when the law took effect, uh, the Cuomo administration has done a dramatic turnaround uh, in its attitude towards medical marijuana. Um, and that wasn't thanks to Cynthia Nixon. The turnaround began long before she became a candidate for governor. Um, it happened, I believe, because apart from the fact that an awful lot of people in the administration just understood that, duh, this makes sense. Um, but it became clear that civilization was not ending because we had medical marijuana. And it became also very clear that more and more and more uh, of the public strongly supported uh, medical marijuana and was kind of annoyed that the law was so restrictive. And so a couple of things happened. One is, as soon as he had authority to do so, the health commissioner added nurse practitioners. Well, not as soon as, but soon after. He then did something else, which to me was eye-opening. He said, physician assistants can write a certification for medical marijuana. Now, the statute said he could add nurse practitioners. Didn't say PAs. He was willing, Dr. Zucker, to look at the PA licensure statute, which says, notwithstanding the provision of any law to the contrary, comma, words that are often found in New York law, they are magic words, uh, comma, a physician assistant may do basically anything a physician can as long as it's under physician supervision and the physician is qualified in that field, blah, blah, blah. Dr. Zerker looked at that and said, hmm, notwithstanding any provision of law, that includes the medical marijuana law. So I can issue a regulation that says, guess what? PAs can write certifications for medical marijuana. The fact that he was willing to take that circuitous route to bringing in PAs uh, to me was just amazing. Um, first of all, I was delighted that he was being nice to physician assistants, but also it showed a dramatic, to me anyway, shift in attitude towards medical marijuana. Uh, they added uh, PTSD to the list of conditions. Um, about a year ago, they added chronic pain uh, to the list of conditions with a very uh, loose, you could call it, definition of what chronic pain is. Um, now, all along, if you had severe pain that was associated with one of the dozen listed conditions, marijuana could be prescribed for that pain. But if it was just pain 
from a condition not among the dozen, you're out of luck. But the commissioner used his authority to add conditions to the list to add chronic pain. And I guess, I don't know, a couple of months ago, they took a further step and added acute pain. So basically, serious pain is now medical marijuana certifiable. Um, I never would have thought that would happen in June of 2014. How did this happen? This happened, uh, again, because, uh, well, I've already said how it happened. So I'm going to stop. Um, want me to take questions? Uh, I'll do that for as long as people are willing. If the presidential election had gone another way, um, I would have said it would have been done by now. Um, it that didn't happen. Uh, Jeff Sessions is a you know a prohibitionist um, uh, on this and some other things. Um, there may well come a point in the next couple of years where Congress really pushes the envelope and gets this done. Uh, Congress has enacted legislation that basically says the federal government shall not use its resources to interfere with any state medical marijuana law, or I think it also applies to adult use marijuana. Um, you would think 30 jurisdictions, which I think is what we're up to now, would, would, would be enough. Um, what will be enough, I don't know. Uh, but certainly at the federal level, Except for the executive branch, we are moving in that direction. And again, it's, it's the popularity of it and capitalism. And the fact that it works. Well, yeah. Uh, and, and that's part of the popularity. I think, frankly, I think the popularity may have more to do with it than, than, than the clinical effectiveness. Uh, but I think the clinical effectiveness helps with the popularity. on what you anticipate the impact will be on progressive legislation given the results of the primary yesterday overturning many of the IDC views. Yeah. Um, the particular individuals who got elected uh, may not be the key thing. Uh, political perception, which I guess you know, began with the, with the Sanders campaign getting as far as it did, and then uh, the Ocasio-Cortez primary uh, uh, back in June, uh, combined with these uh, primaries, I, I think will, will help pull politics uh, somewhat to the left. What will be much more important will be if, if in November we elect a Democratic majority in the state Senate. Um, that will be, I think, enormously dramatic uh, for a lot of issues. Uh, yeah. With the um, June 2018 approval of the Epidiolex, the cannabidiol product, um, do you anticipate any changes with the scheduling of um, cannabis or cannabidiol? Um, Yeah, we will, the Assembly and Senate passed a bill, which the governor is now considering, uh, that says that if and when uh, Epidiolex is formally rescheduled, which I don't think has quite happened yet, um, then we give the health commissioner authority, which we have almost never given him or her authority, would have authority to administratively reschedule that product and its active ingredients under New York law. Um, and we did that in part because there are today people who are using Epidiolex through clinical trials who, if it becomes legal federally but not under state law, they will not be able to get it here in New York because uh, their doctor won't be able to write a prescription because it's no longer covered by a clinical trial and it's still a Schedule I drug in New York, even though 
federally it isn't. And so we need to do something to untie that knot. Uh, I, I hope the governor will sign the bill. I don't see why he wouldn't. Um, but yeah, that all of this starts to become complicated when you think about legalizing adult use, which we are likely to do next year. Um, how does how do the adult use stores, however we organize them, how do they operate side by side with medical marijuana dispensaries? If the adult use store can sell you CBD oil, um, uh, what does that do to the medical marijuana dispensary? Uh, you know, arguably the CBD oil won't be medical grade, but a lot of people aren't going to care. I mean, people who for, for who for years were buying marijuana on the street to deal with their chemotherapy. Uh, problems, uh, they weren't worried about whether it was medical grade marijuana. Um, so, and, and of course the whole federal schedule one or not business continues to be something to try to sort out. But yeah, Epidiolex, um, assuming it, it will shortly be completely kosher at the federal level, uh, we need to do something in New York uh, to make it available. Uh, Dick, just one question about um, <clears throat> the role that uh, community health centers play and the sort of conundrum that we have with our uh, requirement to abide by federal guidelines and the fact that uh, many of the patients that we see in these settings are yeah. asking us to mm -hmm. um, certify them. Um, and um, so I'm just wondering if you could comment on that and then maybe a little bit more generally what you think the role of uh, physician leadership can play to sort of advance some of this going forward because um, there still are a number of reluctant physicians in, yeah. in the system and what, what role I think the state legislature and the, the commissioner could play in getting more people on board. Sort of, you know, yeah. in some ways it's reminiscent of the early days of HIV where there's sort of reluctance of a lot of physicians to treat patients, care mm. for them because of uh, whatever biases and prejudices they have. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, it has been crystal clear all around the country that while a physician, whether sitting in a private office or in a community health center or in this building, uh, can write a medical marijuana certification uh, and nothing bad will happen. Uh, this has been going on for over 20 years now. It goes on today in 30 states. It goes on thousands of times, uh, well, maybe a week. Uh, in New York, it goes on at Mount Sinai um, on a limited basis because of their choice. But if, you know, Mount Sinai, I'm told, will only write a medical marijuana certificate for cancer pain. Uh, well, if you're not going to, if, if you're not going to go to jail for writing it for cancer pain, why would you go to jail for writing it for uh, chemotherapy treatment or HIV uh, wasting syndrome? The answer is you wouldn't. Um, and the National Association of Community Health Centers, uh, why they are putting out, you know, kind of nervous Nelly advice like that, I can't fathom. Uh, I, I think people got over that many, many years ago. Um, the physician community uh, has enormous political power, uh, both as individuals uh, and as an organized uh, body. Uh, uh, often, I mean, the medical society is often uh, well to my right, uh, which annoys me, but you know, it's a free country. Um, Physicians can be very influential. Um, I remember years ago, we had a, a bill to add chicken pox to the list of vaccine uh, requirements. Passed, it was on the verge of passing the assembly. It had come out of the health committee. It was almost on the floor. One of the top staff people to the speaker uh, who you know, advised him on health stuff um, 
his kid's pediatrician told him that he didn't think the evidence was really in yet on the chickenpox vaccine. We should wait a year. He said that to the speaker. That was the end of it. Uh, a year later, fortunately, his kid's pediatrician said, you know, I read a couple of articles. Yeah, it's ready. <laughs> Done. So, you know, I often say some people find it appalling that a, a random pediatrician somewhere in Gilderland can, a suburb of Albany, can hold up state health policy for a year. I actually find it kind of charming. Uh, so physicians need to talk to their legislators. Uh, uh, you know, we don't bite. Um, and I think physicians will find that legislators are eager uh, to learn from them. So, you know, thank you. This, I, I think I've been working with the legislature for, I don't know what, 35 years. I, every time I listen to you, I learn a lot of new things. Um, and I learned a lot today. So thank you, and thanks for continuing to you know, push, push the envelope. I think it's, it's without, without folks like you in progressive positions, I don't know where we would be right now. And, um, and, and just hearing and talking to you in preparation for this, I think um, we have a lot of work to do to get the community health centers on board. And we're gonna, um, we had decided already that we were gonna get um, our own uh, legal opinion on this and see if we could start to move some people in this direction. For those of you who don't know, the National Association's basically come out and very, very strongly and told all of the people that they would be um, in, in dire danger of losing their federal funding if uh, they in any way even suggested to people that they should um, be thinking about mar medical marijuana. They can't certify people that can't prescribe, they can't even recommend. Um, and the only thing they, that they suggested we do is document if a patient comes in and says they're taking it, at least we can document it in the clinical record. So based upon our discussions and stuff, I mean, I, and the things that we've been looking at, we don't really see any um, rational basis for that. So we'll get some legal opinions and see if we can't move the ball forward with community health centers. So thanks. Thank you.